Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to Section E4, Structural Integrity in Buildings. We're going to have two speakers today. But before we go over that, I'd like a couple of housekeeping issues. If you can all silence your cell phones, we wouldn't want them going off during the presentation. Also, if you haven't scanned your badge yet, we'd ask you to wait till after the presentations to scan it in the back. And please keep all your questions till the end. There will be a session in the end where, you can, where they will, uh, both speakers will answer your questions. Our first speaker is going to be Ronald Hamburger. He, Ronald Hamburger is a structural engineer and a senior principal with Simpson, Gumperts, and Heger in San Francisco. Mr. Hamburger has more than 35 years of experience in structural design, evaluation, upgrade research, code and standards development, and education. Mr. Hamburger serves as the chair of the BSSC's Provisions Update Committee and AIC's Connections Pre-Qualification Review Panel, and is a member of the AIC Specification Task Committee 9. Seismic. He is also a member of the ASC 7 Standards Committee and chairs in general criteria task committees. He is a past president and structural engineers of the Structural Engineers Association of California and the National Council of Structural Engineering Associations and current chair of Structural Engineering Certification Board. He was the 2006 Higgins Award winner for his work on design of steel structures to resist progressive collapse his practice focuses on the design of large commercial, residential, and institutional structures with an emphasis on performance-based design procedures. Our second speaker will be Kurt Gustafson. Kurt has more than 40 years of experience in design, construction, and investigation of all sizes and types of structures. After graduation from the University of Illinois, Kurt worked for, for the American Bridge in their Chicago Engineering Department, where he became involved in the fabrication and erection of many unique and exciting steel structures, including Standard Oil and the Sears Tower in Chicago. Aside, aside from his duties to provide technical assistance for the AIC, Kerr provides feedback to the AIC Specification Committee. This feedback evolves from many questions being asked and often will influence the development and updating of AIC specifications and publications to reflect the needs of, of the engineering commu community. Kurt also serves on several national committees involved in monitor monitoring and developing building codes and standards. He is presently a member of the ASE 7 main committee and the NCSEA Code Advisory Quality Assurance Committee and the NCSEA Joint Industry Committee on Structural Integrity. I'd like us all to warmly welcome uh, Ronald Hamburger and Kurt Gustafson. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm somewhat surprised to see the number of people in the room, given that it's 8 a.m. Uh, I'm actually going to serve in the role of a warm-up warm -up act today. Uh, Kurt actually has all of the important information that we want to give you. I'm just going to give you some background on uh, why the information Kurt is giving you is actually important to your practice or may be important to your practice. Uh, so the 2009 IBC is uh, about to be printed. I think it will be available next month. Uh, and from a structural perspective, there's really almost nothing in it that has changed. If you read uh, Structure Magazine or Structural Engineer Magazine, there have been summary articles in it lately. Uh, I think the one in Structural Engineer last month said that one of the most significant changes uh, to the IBC with regard to structures was the addition of structural integrity requirements. I don't agree that it's all that significant, but nevertheless, we're here to tell you about it this morning. So uh, I'll give you a background and history as to why structural integrity requirements uh, got put into the IBC talk a bit about the joint ad hoc committee uh, that Kurt and I were members of that put these together. Uh, the NCSEA committee actually prepared two proposals, only one of which actually made it into the code. Uh, I'll tell you why that happened, and then I'll give you a very brief introduction into the new requirements, and Kurt will tell you all about how to actually comply with them. So, uh, people began to become interested in this topic of structural integrity uh, with this building that you see here, uh, which is known today as the Ronan Point disaster. The disaster part of it is the corner of the building uh, that obviously is missing. This is a precast concrete structure constructed in the early to mid-1960s in a suburb of London, England. Uh, an apartment building, basically a woman got up one cold morning 
uh, went to brew herself up some tea, went into her kitchen, turned on the gas on her stove. She didn't have an automatic pilot, went to light the gas on the stove, uh, was unsuccessful, su successful, I guess, for a few seconds when she finally struck a match and got it lit. Enough gas had accumulated where there was a small explosion. Uh, I'm told it blew her out of her kitchen and then into her living room. Uh, it also blew the two exterior walls of her kitchen, which were load-bearing precast panels, uh, out of the building. And since they were supporting the floors above, the floors above came down, starting a progressive collapse that went, as you can see, all the way from about the 14th level, I believe, where her apartment was located to the ground, as well as all the way up. Um, folks looked at this in the UK uh, and decided, as well as other places, that it was unacceptable behavior. Uh, that this building had been constructed basically as a house of cards, it was an accident waiting to happen, and they needed to do things about it. Recall also that in the 1960s, the UK was having significant problems with the Irish Republican Army, uh, who was doing explosive devices around London and other places with some regularity. So blasts, not only accidental blasts from uh, women having trouble lighting stoves, but intentional blasts were a problem in the UK. And they decided to adopt practices uh, that would make their structures more resistant, principally to explosions is what they were concerned about. Uh, and London, unfortunately, had had the opportunity to see the results of lots of explosions uh, about 20 years prior to this during the World War II Blitz of London. Uh, there was a good body of understanding in the UK uh, about what happens when a bomb strikes the type of buildings that are present in England, uh, and they formulated a number of requirements uh, for design basically wrapped around this World War II experience. So the UK criteria were that all buildings needed to be designed with continuous horizontal and vertical ties, uh, and that they designated certain elements as key elements. And a key element was any element the, uh, which, if it were compromised and could no longer carry vertical load, would result in a significant collapse in the structure. And since they were worried about explosions, uh, and since Ronan, Ronan Point was a gas explosion, they figured that that had created an overpressure of about five pounds per square inch. Uh, and they said, all of your key elements either need to be re designed to resist an explosion of five pounds uh, per square inch, or you need to design your structure so that if the element is destroyed, the structure will stand up. And a series of progressive collapse analysis techniques evolved around that requirement. Although in practice, most people declare that their element, key elements are robust, uh, are able to survive the five PSI. I don't know whether they actually check them, uh, but they declare that and they don't actually do anything. Okay, what was the reaction to all of this in the United States? Well, the answer is not very much. Uh, our building codes for many years largely ignored the issue with very few exceptions. Uh, one of these exceptions was ACI 318, the precast concrete industry, uh, which built things in the United States, much the way things were built in the UK in the 1960s, realized that there was a problem. They came under pressure and recognized that they had to do something uh, about the way their structures are constructed. And so they imported the complete horizontal vertical tie concept from the UK into ACI 318, where it still exists today. Uh, and over the years, ACI 318 added a few other things that are intended to provide basic structural integrity. If you design flat slab structures, you know that you have to have at least two bottom bars or two PD cables extending through the core of each column. Uh, and this is basically to keep the slab from sliding down the column if it punches. Uh, basically, the idea is that the bars or the PT cables will act as a catenary and hold the slab in place, and that's a structural integrity requirement. Uh, ASCE 7 also adopted some structural integrity criteria actually a long time ago, 20 years ago. It's still in ASCE 7. It's under Section 1.4. Uh, it has words about all structures shall be designed such that they can survive uh, small events. It talks about disproportionate collapse. It's totally unenforceable uh, because it doesn't tell you what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to do it. It's just sort of a performance criteria. And besides, the building code doesn't actually adopt Section 1 of ASCE 7. So it has no effect whatsoever. Uh, also within ASCE 7, 
uh, actually hidden cleverly under the seismic provisions for seismic design category A structures. And everyone, in the, everyone sitting here today design structures that are at least seismic design category A, because there is nothing lower. And we call seismic design category A all of those structures that are never actually expected to experience an earthquake. Uh, so what folks did in ASCE 7 for seismic design category A is they put some basic tie and continuity requirements. So you have to anchor exterior walls to diaphragms for certain minimum forces. You have to have a minimum lateral force resisting strength of 1% of the building's weight, that sort of thing. Nothing onerous, but they're there. Okay. Uh, time marched on. All of this happened in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and the U.S. felt it had pretty well taken things uh, care of what needed to be taken care of. Uh, and then the U.S. itself started to become the target of terrorist attacks, first sporadically, uh, and then a little bit more frequently. The first uh, actual incident was in 1983. Some of you may recall the bombing of the U.S. Marine barracks uh, in Lebanon, lost the lives of about 200 servicemen in that one. Uh, 1993, terrorists attempted to take down the World Trade Center towers. They did not do a very good job in 1993. Caused some damage, but didn't actually bring the buildings down. Uh, 1995, I'm sure you will all recall this building in Oklahoma City, the federal building, uh, where some domestic terrorists uh, decided to protest whatever it was they were protesting and blow up a building. Uh, following this building, ASCE, uh, together with FEMA, performed a study of the performance of this building, uh, came to some conclusions that if the building, this was Oklahoma City, obviously, was zone zero for seismic. Uh, this is what today we would call an ordinary concrete moment frame. Uh, had little in the way of ties. There was no confinement of lap splices. Uh, beams had reinforcing steel for flexure at the ends of the beam spans where the gravity moments would be at the top uh, and not at the bottom so there was no ability to take load reversals in the structure. Perfectly good code conforming structure uh, for when it was constructed and for the loads it was constructed for it just wasn't particularly resistant to this type of attack. And ASCE basically had a, well, not a finding, but sort of an observation that, gee, maybe if the structure had been designed with some of the ductility and the integrity requirements that are built into structures in higher seismic zones, uh, the building would have been able to redistribute loads better uh, and would not have collapsed to the same extent that it did. There have been lots of people uh, that have contested that in this particular case, but that was an observation that was made. And is in part perhaps why the seismic design category A provisions attempt to address structural integrity in some small way. Time marched on. Uh, 1998, we had twin bombings from Al Qaeda and two of our farming embassies, uh, both on the same day, actually. A uh, number of fatalities resulted from these. Uh, this finally, with the 1995 Mara building bombing in Oklahoma City. Uh, and the embassy bombings in uh, Tanzania and Kenya in 1998. This got the eyes of the State Department going, uh, and they started requiring blast-resistant design of embassies throughout the world. Uh, and the eyes of General Services Administration were also opened, and they decided that they needed to design all important government buildings to resist potential terrorist attack. Uh, and the GSA and State Department criteria go through a series of things that you need to do if you're designing one of these buildings. One of them is you need to do a risk analysis of what the threats are to the structure, uh, what types of weapons might be brought to bear on it, uh, and what the risks are if such a weapon is brought to bear. Uh, it encouraged site planning for new construction that would provide for some protection against potential attacks, including setbacks from streets so people can't drive a vehicle containing bombs up to the front door, get out and leave them there to explode, but rather set the building back a significant distance to reduce the effects of uh, potential explosions. Also screening, security provisions, uh, digital TV camera security, all the things that we see when we go in and out of public buildings today. Uh, they determined that the most significant hazard to people as a result of terrorist attack was not actually collapse of the structure, but actually glazing hazards. Uh, because most buildings are not going to be the subject of a bomb attack, but if you're building a building in a major metropolitan area, New York, Los Angeles, uh, someone has one building that they're having as a target, 
They pick a rider truck, they park it in front of the building, they try and blow it up like they did the Merritt building. The the explosive force from that blast, very, very destructive of the building they targeted, but it will also be quite destructive of the exterior cladding on buildings for miles around. Uh, And they actually found that the most, actually the most fatalities and the most injuries in these attacks occurred not in the buildings that were the target, but in the surrounding buildings where the glazing blew inside and basically were shards that cut people to ribbons. Uh, And so they adopted programs to design blast-resistive glazing and cladding on structures and instituted requirements to design buildings, considering progressive collapse and designing to avoid the potential for progressive collapse. Then, of course, uh, eight years ago, on September 11, 2001, there were the attacks on the World Trade Center, not with bombs, but with airplanes. We all recall that, I'm sure. Uh, This resulted in a number of things. One of them was a group in New York City known as the Citizens for Skyscraper Safety uh, who declared that the Twin Towers had been death traps and that uh, they were basically accidents waiting to happen and the building codes needed to change. Uh, This group was composed, many of the people of this group were people who lost people in 9-11. They were hurt, they were confused. Uh, They needed to feel that something needed to be done. They picked on the building codes. Uh, Politicians, however, being the opportunists they are, were always willing to step forward and demonstrate that they had taken action, that they had heard the public and taken action. And Senators Clinton and Schumer, both from New York, demanded action. Uh, And part of that action was an award to the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, of a significant amount of uh, funding uh, to study the WTC collapses and specifically to develop criteria to go into the building code to make sure that this sort of accident would never happen, not accident, this sort of attack. Uh, would never result in the same type of consequences. Of course, that's impossible to do, uh, but nevertheless, NIST took the money. Uh, and came out with a report in 2005 that had, I think, 14 points in it, 14 recommendations, some of which had nothing to do with terrorist collapse, some of which had to do with things like designing buildings for wind, because we all know the World Trade Center fell down in a strong wind, right? Anyway, uh, NIST's first recommendation, number one on their hit parade, was that progressive collapse should be presented in buildings through the development and national adoption of consensus standards and code provisions along with the tools and guidance needed for their practice. And then they went forward and got more funding from Congress to develop such things. Uh, Of course, they didn't actually develop anything. Instead, what they did was they um, charged an engineer who was working for the chief building official of New Jersey, uh, who had, had no idea what he was doing, to sit down and do this. Um, and he basically took the UK standards, didn't understand them, rewrote them into code change proposals, and put them forward to ICC. Uh, What they did do with the money, besides paying this engineer, uh, was they developed a technical subcommittee on terror-resistant buildings uh, within the ICC itself. They also hired NIBS, the National Institute of Building Sciences, uh, to put together code proposals. And these were not technical people. These were people on the fringe of technical work, and they were incapable of putting together proposals. All they could do was lobby and threaten. Um... They did, as I say, get this building official to cobble together something based on the UK standards, uh, which would have required mandatory uh, design of all buildings uh, to resist potential progressive collapse, all buildings in excess of three stories tall. This obviously got the attention of the engineering community. The National Council of Structural Engineers Associations put together an ad hoc joint industry committee uh, that included the alphabet soup of organizations that you see here. Uh, Basically, the reason this committee was put together was to figure out how to fight this push that was being put forward uh, by the ICC and NIBS groups. Uh, And the committee decided that the political environment was such as that the building code folks felt that they had to do something. Now, the conclusion of the NCSEA committee was basically that there was nothing wrong with our present building codes with regards to progressive collapse. 
Uh, we felt that we are not building houses of cards. We felt that the World Trade Center buildings were not disasters waiting to happen. Being engineers, we all recognize that we design for certain loads, and if you exceed those loads by enough, you're going to produce structural failures and collapses. So we didn't feel that there was anything wrong with the building codes, but we recognized that many politically strong people did, and they were going to push something forward into the building codes. Uh, and so we figured we would offer something up ourselves that would not be harmful to the profession. All right? And so that's what we attempted to do. It would basically, uh, please don't repeat this, uh, but our intent was to ins instill provisions that would have little effect on the way people actually design things, little effect on the actual cost of construction, but allow people, politicians and building officials to run around thinking they had done a wonderful thing by improving the building code greatly. So the NCSEA committee uh, developed and submitted two proposals to the International Code Council. Uh, one of these was a requirement to do mandatory risk analyses uh, when you do certain designs of certain types of buildings. Uh, and in the risk analysis, identify potential risks. Terrorist attack would be one of these risks. And to the satisfaction of the, of the building official, incorporate measures in your design to mitigate the risk. It doesn't say that you have to eliminate them. It says you have to satisfy the building official that you've done reasonable things to mitigate the risk. And this was proposed for all buildings in excess of 420 feet in height with occupancies, occupancies exceeding 5,000 persons. So not even residential high-rise buildings, but basically commercial office buildings. Uh, and structures with very large occupancies exceeding 20,000. We were thinking convention centers, uh, sports arenas, things of that nature. Uh, the other proposal that we put together required, would have required basic structural integrity criteria that wouldn't hurt anyone in this room uh, for all structures four stories or taller. And these were put through. Uh, basically what this would do, the proposal was to establish minimum interconnection criteria for beams, columns, slabs, exterior walls, etc very similar to the precast concrete requirements that were put into ACI 318. So what happened? We submitted these uh, for inclusion in the 2009 IBC. We went to the code hearings in February in Palm Springs of 2007, I believe. Uh, and proposal number one on risk analysis was held before, was considered by ICC's General Requirements Committee. Uh, these are the people that deal with the heights and areas requirements, uh, the occupancy categories, things of that nature. Uh, and up at the hearings, a large body of building officials went up to the podium and complained about how this was a terrible thing to do, uh, this risk analysis. And the reason they felt it was a terrible, terrible thing to do was that, first of all, too many structures would fall under the criteria. They pointed out that the convention center in Palm Springs, where the code hearings were being held, had an occupancy in excess of 20,000 people, and you would have to do this for this building. Why should we do that for this building? Well, because there are a lot of people in the building, but they argue this. Uh, and their real argument, and since the committee that was hearing the arguments was composed of building officials, was that it assigned too much responsibility to the building official. Uh, they would become the person responsible to decide what risk is acceptable and what mitigations are acceptable, and they basically didn't want the responsibility. Uh, they were concerned that they would find themselves in constant arguments with design teams and development teams. Uh, they would be making decisions, deciding that there were risks, and then the development teams would run to the city councils, apply political pressure, and they would be overturned. They just didn't want to deal with it. Uh, and not surprisingly, the proposal was denied by the general committee. Now, this is done by a vote. Uh, there are about 14 people that submit on the committee. The vote against this proposal was 14 to 0. The uh, second proposal introduced the basic structural integrity requirements. Uh, many groups also complained about this proposal, including some of the groups in the alphabet soup uh, that made up the NCSEA committee. Uh, the complaint was basically that nothing was required. We're not building houses of cards. We don't need to do this. I can't really argue with them, but uh, that's what they complained about. 
They said it was too broad, captured too many building types. There were many four-story buildings that weren't really a risk. For example, a four-story Motel 6 uh, on Interstate 10 out in the middle of the desert somewhere probably is not a risk of terrorist attack, but it would have been required to consider this. Uh, was not really needed. The codes provide adequate protection already. Uh, and many of these groups resented the implication that our building codes and practices were unsafe. I resented that also. I don't think it's the case. Uh, the ICC committee, the structural committee, heard this one, found the argument persuasive, denied this one by a vote of 12 to 2. And I can't say that I was disappointed when they turned down my proposal. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't stop there. In the code adoption process, there are a series of hearings. There are these code committee hearings that occur early in the development cycle. And then just before the code is published, and this just happened last fall for the 2009 IBC, there's a general meeting of the ICC, much like the National Steel Construction Conference. People come from all over the country to it. Uh, and people can challenge the code committee actions at that hearing. And the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Technology challenged both committees' actions on both proposals, uh, requested slight modifications to both proposals and approval of both proposals as modified. Uh, proposal one on risk analysis died. The building officials still didn't want to have anything to do with responsibility. Uh, proposal number two, as amended, was accepted and placed into the 2009 IBC. So that's really what we're here to talk to you about is what is this proposal number two. It introduces a new section 1614 into the code. Uh, section 1614.1 talks about applicability. And the applicability of these requirements is to high-rise buildings. And in the definition of the code, that's any building that's 75 feet or more above the grade plane. So basically six and seven story buildings can qualify. Uh, in occupancy categories three and four. So occupancy categories are three and four are things, occupancy category three are uh, buildings that have very large numbers of people in them, so very large office buildings, convention centers would qualify. Uh, things that the failure of which would pose a significant risk to the public, uh, some types of electric power facilities and water treatment facilities qualify as occupancy category three. Of course, none of them are seven stories high. Uh, so basically, occupancy category three are buildings with very large numbers of people in it. Occupancy category four are essential facilities, fire stations, police stations, none of those are seven stories tall, and hospitals. So if you design hospitals, this will definitely affect you or if you design buildings with a lot of people. Section 1614.2, definitions. Section 1614.3 applies to frame structures. Section 1614.4 to bearing wall structures. We won't spend a lot of time on bearing wall structures here today because there aren't very many steel bearing wall structures that are constructed. Uh, instead, most of what Kurt will be talking about are the requirements as they apply to frame structures. Uh, there is that other gray material called reinforced concrete. Uh, these provisions apply to reinforced concrete as well. Uh, section 1614.3 requires that reinforced concrete frame structures conform to provisions that are already in ACI 318. Did no harm. Uh, and basically what that requires is that in addition to the requirements that are already in ACI 318, ACI 318 requires that you have these structural integrity bars or strands. Uh, if you're designing flat slab structures or even beam column structures, at least two bottom bars in each direction or PT cables in each direction have to extend through and over the column core. ACI 318 says. Uh, what ACI 318 doesn't say is what the strength of those in structural integrity reinforcement need to be. Uh, so you could satisfy the ACI 318 criteria by running a couple of number three bars through the column. Uh, and if you have a very long span concrete structure, it's arguable that number three bars will do very much to help anything. Uh, so what we did do is uh, we required that these bars must be spliced with class A splices uh, and we did specify what the minimum strength of these integrity bars is. 
Uh, and so now the code will say that the integrity bars must have a tensile strength equal to at least two-thirds of the vertical reaction from the slab or beam onto the column. Uh, and this was done largely to keep the requirements for concrete very similar to the requirements that were placed into it for steel, which I'll tell you in about in a moment. Uh, there is some relaxation for this if you have a monolithically cast structure uh, and the reinforcing in the slabs is 0, 0, 1, 5 in each direction, it always is, uh, then you can use uh, not two-thirds, but one-third, there's an error on the slide, one-third of the vertical reaction as your design force for the tendons. Uh, this little cartoon here illustrates how this would be done. Uh, so if you have a flat slab structure and you want to design the uh, integrity steel that will take forces T1, uh, T1 would be two-thirds of, of the maximum of either V1 or V2, because uh, that's the vertical reaction delivered in that direction to the column, unless, of course, this was monolith monolithically cast, which almost all concrete structures are, in which case it would be one-third of V1 or v V2. Uh, similarly, tensile forces T2 would be two-thirds or one-third of the maximum of V3 or V4. So not very difficult requirements if you're designing concrete structures. Uh, for steel structures, these, these requirements apply to structures that are constructed of structural steel, composite concrete on structural steel, or steel and joists and joist girders. Uh, there are several requirements. First of all, there's a column splice requirement. It says each column splice shall have the minimum design strength and tension to transfer the design dead and live load tributary to the column between the splice and splice or base immediately below in tension. Uh, let me explain what I mean here. So we're looking at a tiered structure. We're looking at a very small portion of a column schedule on a tiered structure uh, where there are 50 kip dead and live loads that are coming to the column at each floor level. Uh, we have column splices at every second floor. Uh, and the portion of the column between two column splices will pick up two floor levels. Uh, so there'll be 100 kips of tributary load to that section of the column. It means the column splices uh, need to be designed for 100 kips of tension in addition to whatever bearing forces they need to be designed for. Beam, beam connections. End connections of all beams and girders shall have a minimum nominal tensile strength equal to the required vertical shear strength for allowable stress design, or two-thirds of the required shear strength for load and resistance factor design, but not less than 10 kips. So this is the same requirement we just talked about for concrete structures. You look at the vertical reaction being imposed on the column or support by the beam. You make sure that the tensile capacity of the connection, not the shear capacity, but the tensile capacity uh, is equal to two-thirds of that, but not less than 10 kips. Uh, and there is an exception if you have composite slabs, and we specify the minimum number of shear studs that need to be required, but if you have composite slabs, then again that can be reduced to one-third. So it's an inducement to use composite slabs in such structures. Uh, and for the purpose of this check, you need not consider that the vertical shear forces from gravity loads and these tensile forces from accidental loads are concurrent. You can consider them separately. So another cartoon here looking at a frame, the beam coming off the lower left-hand corner. If it has a 100 kip gravity load that it's imposing on the column and it does not have a composite slab, you would have to design that connection for a 67 kip tensile force. And if it does have a composite slab, a 33 kip tensile force. Section 1614.4 applies to bearing wall structures. Uh, it does require longitudinal transverse perimeter and vertical ties. The design forces are specified based on the weight of the material. This applies to all bearing wall structures that are, that are more than 75 feet high, so it won't be wood structures, could be cold form steel structures, could be concrete structures, could be masonry structures. Uh, there's a little cartoon in the provisions that you see here uh, that was basically stolen out of ACI 318 uh, that defines what longitudinal, transverse, and perimeter ties are and vertical ties and gives you formula for deciding how much tensile force each one of those need to be designed for. All of you are uh, perfectly capable of figuring that one out. Uh, this says questions, but we're not actually going to do questions now. I'll bring Kurt up. Well, now that we've seen what, what's in the provisions, uh, 
how is this going to affect steel structures? Uh, okay, uh, I put up the website in the proceedings. There's a paper in there that I did on this that's we'll never be able to cover it in today's session. So uh, that is the website for the proceedings where you can download the papers that have been submitted. It's uh, uh, www.aisc.org forward slash 2009 and ASCC proceedings. I encourage you to read that because we're going to try and cover some of what, what we can today, but we'll never get, get through the, what's in there because there's a lot of calculations in there and, and how this is going to affect the structures. Uh, the first, these are the topics that are covered in the paper. Uh, first of all is what types of buildings are covered by the IBC structural integrity requirements. Ron just went through a lot of this, so we'll get through this real quickly. Uh, second one is, uh, Ron has also been through as to what requirements are applicable to steel frame structures. We'll get through that pretty quickly too. Uh, this one is, uh, now we're starting looking at structural integrity structures and what limit states are we going to consider because uh, when conducting a structural integrity check because uh, our specification has never dealt with limit states for certain performance characteristics that we're looking at. Uh, one thing that Ron didn't mention when he went through the provisions that I will get to is, is that basically the requirements for the structural integrity are based on a nominal strength capacity rather than a design or allowable strength capacity. So you're, you're actually looking at the connection strength on a design or allowable strength basis, but then when you take the, the uh, equivalent horizontal force, that capacity is based on a nominal strength capacity. Uh, and we, this is where we're going to spend most of our time. Uh, what are the performance characteristics of common steel connection types to accommodate axial tension? Uh, the last two we're, we're really not going to have time to get into, but we've done a study in the, uh, that's in the paper of the effect of structural integrity requirements on shear connections. Which there's a lot of calculations and a lot of comparison of limit states and, and exactly how this is going to affect connections. And the last one is some, there's some sam sample calculations in there for a structural integrity check. Okay, first of all, what types of buildings? We'll go through this real quickly. Uh, this, is, this is basically the, the section. And again, it's what, as Ron said, it's uh, uh, buildings and high-rise buildings and assigned to occupancy categories three or four. Uh, the second one is what requirements are applicable to steel frame buildings. And I put the whole section up there and don't, don't try to read it. Uh, we'll go through each of them individually. But, but basically, I, I just wanted to show you that it's not a real long uh, provision and most of it is the exception in there that you see that Ron talked about, the provisions for the exception. Uh, and here's the two categories that we, column splice, minimum tension strength is the one thing covered. The other is the nominal axial tensile strength of beam end connections. This is the first part of the provision where Ron talked about each column's place shall have the minimum design strength and tension to transfer the design. This is the one provision that's probably more tied to progressive collapse than it is minimum requirements because you're really looking at what happens if a column gets taken out underneath that you can hang that column from above. And, and again, similar to what Ron said, you're carry the floor loads tributary to that column from the column splice above. Now we'll get into the axial tensile strength and this is where, where Ron had shown that uh, the, and you'll notice there the tensile, all beams and girders shall have a minimum nominal axial tensile strength equal to the required vertical shear strength. So, uh, and it's two-thirds for AS, for Oh, 100% for ASD and two-thirds for the uh, LRFD, 
which is similar to the provisions in there for the concrete. Uh, so this is saying you use the design vertical reaction to determine the required tensile axial force. So if you have, uh, if you're doing ASD design and you've designed your vertical reaction for VA, well then ASD you have uh, one, 100% of your vertical reaction is taken horizontally. But again, uh, or similar, if you're doing LRFD design, your ultimate shear strength uh, that you've designed your connection for is two-thirds of VU. But remember, the connection is designed using a phi or an omega factor, but the connection is checked without the phi or omega factor. We're looking at the ultimate capacity of that connection to resist the force. Here's the section we just looked at, and here's the long exception that uh, basically, again, is saying that, uh, that if you provide these minimum requirements, which is basically shear studs and some minimal tensile strength or some minimal reinforcing, that you can use one-third for LRFD or half of, uh, for ASD. So this is like an except where the exception does not apply. If you don't have shear connectors, you haven't made the system composite, uh, it would not apply. And if you had shear connectors and adequate welded wire fabric or reinforcing, uh, that it would apply. <laughs> so here is the, the, the summary of the requirements with whether the exception is met or not met uh, if, with uh, ASD design uh, requirements for the vertical capacity. If the exception is not met, your tensile, nominal tensile force has to be VA or half VA if it is met. Similarly, two-thirds for LRFD or one-third. So what you're going to do is use a design and check procedure. You're going to design the connection the same way you've always designed it and just check the uh, connection to see what if it can take the tensile axial force. Okay, now what limit states do we consider conducting a structural integrity check? Uh, remember that the structural integrity provisions reflect designing of, for a force requirement associated with under, other than normal usage uh, when assessing the capacity of the connection to accommodate the structural integrity provisions we're attempting to assess the ultimate capacity of the connection. Therefore, there are some limit states to assess the capacity uh, associated with normal usage which not necessarily be criteria for assessing the capacity at the ultimate conditions. Uh, in Chapter J of the specification, we have uh, limit states that are typical basic limit states for connection design, which define capacity independent of the direction of force. So if those limit states are applied, you can, you can use them uh, whether you're looking at the vertical or the horizontal capacity. And these are typically like bolt shear, plate yielding, plate rupture, the bearing at the bolt hole, and block shear. But when you're conducting a structural integrity check, remember you're looking at nominal strength performance criteria. Uh, you're looking at simple connections, not moment connections. The uh, limit states for simple sure connections are based on, based on deformation or yielding of the components, of the connection components, should not be considered limit states for me meeting these structural integrity requirements. Uh, we're not really concerned that yielding occurs in many connection types yielding may be a good thing to, to allow movement in the connection prior to fracture. Uh, rupture limit states are applicable. Nominal limit states should be checked. Uh, so these, these limit states, bolt shear, plate rupture, and block shear are probably going to, whether you're looking at horizontal or vertical, if you're looking at the uh, connection capacity, they're, they're going to be applicable no matter which way the force is going. You know, for instance, a, a bolt in shear is going to take the same load whether it's vertical or horizontal. That's a simple one. Uh, plate yielding, we, it's really questionable that plate yielding has to be checked for the horizontal 
load because a lot of times yielding is a good thing. Uh, bearing strength that the bolt holds, uh, which we would consider deformation and serviceability considerations for the vertical force. Well, they really shouldn't be necessary considerations for the uh, horizontal force because, again, deformation is good. Serviceability, we're not really concerned with serviceability of the structure for these ultimate cases. So we proposed some, uh, this is in the balloting process, we proposed some specification charging language in uh, the 2010 AISC specification, the ballot, which is uh, being balloted at this time. Uh, we've added the term normal usage into the specification because typically what you see in the first paragraph there is already in our chapter B requirements, but we're defining normal usage now as what's applicable. And then we have added a, a section, proposed adding a section for uh, design criteria for member connections that are required to meet the structural integrity requirements of the applicable building code, reflect nominal strength performance criteria rather than the LRFD design strength or the ASD allowable strength of the specification. Uh, we've also said that uh, limit states for sheer, simple shear connections based on deformation or yielding of the connection components are not considered limit states for meeting the structural integrity requirements. Rupture limit states for applicable nominal limit states must be checked. So this, this if, if any balloting process is, is subject to uh, question from anybody, public or committee. So this is what we put in the specification right now in the ballot. It's, uh, our ballots are, I think it'll be finished. This is in the last ballot, or I think it'll be this summer. So uh, we'll see what the comments come back from the specification committee and from the public. And there's, there's, there's one other thing. Uh, if you know in the connection design, you know, for slotted holes, they're, if, you're, if they're parallel with the direction of the force, you're supposed to use slip critical connections. Well, we don't really care about this for the structural integrity check. So we, we proposed adding uh, uh, a section in there that uh, for the purpose of meeting only the structural integrity provisions of the applicable building code, bearing bolts and connections with short slotted holes parallel to the direction of the tension are permitted. For the purpose of checking bearing, these bolts shall be assumed to be located at the end of the slot. So this is what things that we have ha been uh, scrambling to address since the uh, ICC or IBC accepted the provisions and are introduced, which happened in late September. So everything we've been uh, been doing is trying to catch up now and be prepared because our specification has been we're in the third ballot right now and it's nearing the end of the cycle so we if we're going to have anything in the 2010 spec to address it uh, it's got to be in there right now so we've been struggling to get that in and here's the one on plate yielding you know typically if you're looking at at a uh, vertical reaction on a beam you're looking at shear yielding in the plate but we're really not concerned with, with, with tensile yielding for the horizontal force. It, as a matter of fact, the tensile yielding would never control over the shear yielding, so that's a very simple one to look at. Uh, for the bearing strength that the bolt holds for the vertical shear, we typically look at both tear out and hold deformation. <coughs> well, for the horizontal force, we're still going to be looking at tear out, which is probably going to be controlling in a lot of these cases would be your controlling limit state. Whether it's on the plate or on a beam web or, or, or whatever, but we're really not concerned as much with hole deformation at this ultimate con condition. So we're suggesting that, that deformation is really not a consideration that we're really looking at the tear outside of the bolt bearing equation. 
Okay, this is the one where we we'll probably spend most of the time, is, is what are the performance characteristics of common steel connection types to accommodate axial tension forces? Uh, there's been a lot of work done in, <coughs> in the UK uh, since they've had these provisions for 40 years in their codes. So the steel industry in the UK has done a lot of testing of a, of a lot of connections types some of which uh, we commonly use are of the most common types. Uh, there are other types of connections that we, we are using more, f uh, more exclusively in the U.S., like uh, single angle connections and things that uh, really have not been addressed. So we're, gonna, we're focusing on uh, what I'm going to go through is, is look at the characteristics of what the British have te shown and how these can accommodate axial tensile forces. Uh, they've, like I said, they've included tie force requirements for many decades. There's been a lot of research done. Uh, they've developed a manual. Good. <laughs> They've developed a manual, uh, Joints and Simple Construction, which was done by the steel, thank you. By the Steel Construction Institute and the British Constructional Steelwork Association, which is a lot of what I'm going to be going through here, which uh, very clearly shows the uh, connection attributes to, to address tie forces. Uh, the first one is the single plate shear connection, which you can uh, see was taken from our steel manual, which is a very common connection used in our, in earth, uh, both ours and in the UK. Uh, the thing about this connection is it, it doesn't it doesn't really matter whether you're taking a vertical or horizontal load. The limit states are the same, uh, so it's a very simple one to to look at. Uh, for the vertical shear, we're again looking at the bolt shear, shear yielding, and so on. And we do consider deformation for the bolt bearing. For the uh, structural integrity check, again, we're considering bolt shear. Tensile yielding is real questionable whether we should really need to check it. It's not going to control anyway. Uh, tensile rupture, uh, bolt bearing, and deformation is not considered, and block shear. And again, remember, we're looking at the nominal uh, capacity for the horizontal connection, whereas the connection had originally been designed for the uh, using the phi or omega factor. Uh, double angle shear connections. Uh, this is one that, that really limits states for horse, horizontal connections. Uh, are not really ad addressed because you're you're not now looking at a lot of deformation in the angles when you start getting to to uh, horizontal uh, connections. The uh, we've done a lot of testing and research to accommodate the vertical shear reaction and you know well documented in the manuals for design procedures. Uh, there are several combinations uh, of of double angles. The all bolted. Uh, the bolted welded and the all welded. Some of these work very well for for uh, horizontal axial forces. Others not so well. Okay. The typical all bolted double angle connection, when subjected to an axial tensile force, will provide significant ductility and a yield mechanism will form in the angles. Uh, the angles subject to an axial tension exhibit a tendency to straighten out. The common failure mode is tensile fracture of the angle legs. And uh, this is from the SE, and I had permission to use their, their documents. Uh, this is what, what's actually happening when they get the tensile tie force. And what you're finding is most of the fracture is occurring near the heel and the angles. And the way they address this connection is uh, part of the axial tensile force is resisted by tension, actually, in the legs of the angles. 
of, of the straightening leg. And there's also shears associated with the resulting moments caused by the eccentric offset. Uh, and as I said, the tensile resulting failure mode of the angles is usually rupture near the critical sections at the heel of the angles, again, right in here. So SCI publication 212, which is this British publication, indicates that the prying force which you're getting in these angles uh, from these bolts can conservatively be neglected when assessing the tensile capacity of the bolts in the outstanding leg of the double angle connections. If 0.80, if 80 percent of the nominal tensile strength is used to determine the capacity. So it's a, it's a very simple thing. Uh, and if you really look, go through it, this is a quick calculation I, w I went through. If you really look at it, the, the limit state of bolt tension will never control in this case. Because basically, again, because you're looking at the nominal capacity. The other thing you have to look at is the, uh, the area around here, which is basically, again, in the web, in the double angles, is basically your typical nominal your typical basic limit states, you know, for bolt shear and so on. Uh, that's going to be the same thing in the, both the angles and the web of the beam. Uh, remember, double angle connections, it's, it's usually, uh, you're always in double shear, so your angles are going to be taking half of the tensile force, whereas the, uh, the beam web is going to be taking most of it. So unless you have some uh, real thin angles in relation to a real thick beam web, you're probably going to be, the beam web is going to be your controlling uh, limit states for your tensile force, and that's probably going to be a, a tear out at the end of the uh, beam web. Uh, you also, when you're looking at the double angles, remember that uh, the eccentricities are, are generally very uh, limited, your edge distances are very limited, so uh, it's probably your edge distance tear outs that are, you're going to be really looking at. So for the bolts, you're, for double, all bolted double angles, you're looking at uh, bolt shear, the angles of the beam web are in double shear, uh, bolt tension, and again I put there will never control based on what I've gone through. Uh, each ang for the angles, each angle is checked for, for Tn over 2, and the tensile fracture considered at the next section of the bolt holes, uh, bolt bearing, tear out, block shear, uh, the beam web again, I doubt tensile yielding probably need, need not be checked, tensile fracture, bolt bearing, we're looking at tear out, not deformation, and then block shear. Uh, the double angle connections, uh, which are bolted to the support and welded to the support of the beam. This is another, not as uh, common, most most uh, beam shops now are that like to do uh, holes are because of the equipment they have, you're, you're seeing more and more bolted, bolted. But this was a, this is also a common type of connection. The thing is the... Uh, <clears throat> The British publications really don't address the performance of this connection type, and it's going to be somewhat different than the all bolted because basically the legs are not going to have as much capacity to straighten out because you're welding it uh, across the top and bottom of the angle to the to the uh, beam web. So uh, so. We're starting to take a look at this type of connection uh, uh, to resist axial tension forces. This is one area where the British really haven't done any testing, so we've, we've started initiating testing to see what kind of performance we're getting in this. So this is really a work in progress. We're trying to assess, even though the capacity, the, the tensile forces are maybe very small, we still want to know what the performance of these connection types are going to be to get an idea. Uh, so the double angle, this is the other kind where the double angle connections are welded to the support. 
This is really not a good type of connection to accommodate a uh, tensile force because the welds along the outstanding leg of the angle, you're really putting that weld in, in torsion, and we don't know very much. We really have no reliability for the torsion on that weld. So this will be down on our list as to what, because uh, when we start looking at them, because we don't know what type of tensile capacity we're going to get out of those. These, these are mostly used a lot for renovation work, and they're not a really commonly used connection type, but people have used them over the years, but uh, they're not really suitable for a tensile axial force that, from what we can uh, see. Uh, so probably should avoid these until we find out more, unless you want to add additional reinforcement or something to take the tensile force in another manner. Uh, here's another common connection type that we've been, is quite commonly used in the U.S. is the end plate shear connection. Uh, the British have also been testing this one. You see a similar type of yielding mechanism that occurs in the uh, angles or in the end plate at, at both points. Again, you want to let it yield, but... Uh, so we're not really going to test this one. I haven't gotten too much into this type of connection, but it, it's really uh, very similar. It's not as much, uh, they didn't get as much deformation as this that they did with the double angles, but again, it's probably more the stiffness of the web, but uh, or the stiffness of the plate. Uh, but it's again, it's going to accommodate the, the forces without uh, much problem. Uh, here's the single angle shear connections, which they do not address, and it's ve becoming very common replacing the single plate shear connection uh, in many cases because beams, fabricators like to use them now because of their beam lines where they're punching everything rather than welding. They do very little, want to do very little welding. Uh, again, they're not tested. We're, we have already initiated testing of some of these to determine the capacity. Again, you're looking at the non-symmetry. If, if you have an angle, if you have a slab in place, you're probably going to find much more capacity to take the torsional or in-plane res resistance. Uh, but uh, we we want to see what they're going to do. Uh, we, we think they'll, they'll probably work without much problem. Uh, the, the British UK said, said basically uh, to avoid except with experimental evidence of axial capacity. Well, we're initiating research to determine that experimental evidence. Here's another one that that's, could be a real problem. Uh, you know, seated connections are, are typically, uh, you can typically get a very large vertical reaction uh, with some of with some of these, when you have a very heavily loaded, you'd rather sit it on something than 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 frame it into the web. And and uh, it, to, but the horizontal capacity could be somewhat limited, and you may be able to add weld or some top and bottom angles similar to a to a semi rigid connection to take some axial capacity. But you don't want to. On the other hand, you don't want to limit the rotation capacity to. You don't want to kill yourself for your to take your vertical reaction to take the horizontal tie force. So, uh, this is this is one you you really have to look at and see what your force is and if you see if you can take in some way through the top and the bottom. Uh, uh, you might be able to to do it, but if you if you have a very large vertical reaction, it's going to be going to be a difficult one to take a horizontal capacity, even though you're taking it at a nominal strength level. Uh, you may be able to take it, you know, through the slab or something else, some other reinforcing through the slab or, 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 uh, so here, here was just one. I, so in summary, uh, after several, uh, single plate, double angle and end plate connection checks, you're probably going to find that it will become apparent that most of these connection types will meet the structural integrity requirements without modification. Uh, seated connections may require some adjustment of detail to enhance the capacity to resist axial force. 
uh, single angle connections <coughs> is is untested and unknown at this time, but we're, we are initiating research to study the effect on the axial tension force on these connection types. And here's, here's the parts I'm not going to check, and I'll show you a little bit real quickly what, what we've done in the paper. Uh, we studied the effect of the structural integrity requirements on shear connections. We did a quite a comprehensive study of, of uh, limit state checking the hor vertical limit state to horizontal limit state uh, for the basic chapter J connection requirements and and you'll find that that the uh, that the, uh, the the tension force requirement will generally not control the connection design so very rarely would you probably Find it. I, I haven't found a case where, but I haven't been through <laughs> a lot. Uh, in these in these studies, we very conservatively assume that the maximum ASD or LRFD vertical pick capacity for the limit state controls the vertical connection capacity. So we're taking the the maximum that that connection can take, not the actual design reaction, but the maximum it can take, and we're, we're not looking, we, we don't look at taking the 50% reduction in required horizontal force. In other words, that there's no slab on there with shear connectors or anything. And we're still finding that the, all of these limit states, they're not going to control for the horizontal capacity. And this is basically what I just said, that, that uh, ah, these are a lot of limit states that we don't want to go through. <laughs> and... Uh, the sample calculations at the end, again, we go through a typical check sample calculation and, and, uh, and uh, of, a, of a given beam size and a connection. And again, we, the summary, we found that the uh, horizontal connection requirement never controls. So here's a summary. The structural integrity address minimum connection requirements, again, Requirements for progressive collapse, such as member removal, are not covered by these provisions. And remember, this people really call it, start calling it uh, progressive collapse. But, but these requirements are really minimum. You know, it's like the old, when we used to, everybody used to think you had two bolt minimum or, or, or in a connection, which isn't, really has never been in this back, but <laughs> we've talked about putting it back in. Uh, the... Uh, are only required for high-rise buildings of occupancy categories three or four, although what the tests, the, the examples in the, in the studies we've been through, it, it doesn't matter. These, these, that applies to all connections, whether you're looking at these types of buildings or not. Uh, column splice, minimum tension strength, and nominal axial tensile strength, these are the things that are covered in the provisions. And many common connection types required in all classifications of structural steel buildings and designed in accordance with the AISC spec will meet the structural integrity requirements without modification. And that's it. Now we'll take questions. <laughs> It's beam to beam. It's all connections. All connections. Yes. But uh, we don't have to concern ourselves with panels on the yielding of the one side of the column well or well, you got, you've got to still concern yourself with, with if you're taking an axial tensile force as if you're taking it in anything. In any whether you're looking at web yielding or, or like we do have but there's no transfer forces across if that's what you're asking, across the column. Well, we do have to concern ourselves with the panels on the yielding for the column well. Oh yes. But 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 you don't have to consider this as a transfer force if that's what you were asking. As in other words, this is limited to that connection. It's limited to that connection. It's not like like this is a, a force that has to be transferred through the system. Well no, I'm trying to transfer to the column. Oh, okay. Yeah, you still have to transfer it to the column. So to the column. The yeah. column well has to be good for this force. Yes. Yes. Place. Yes. And and the one thing being Beam, well, yes. 
Yes. Yes. John. With regard to the loan path, is Jason, how far do you chase the loan? You don't. That's what I was just trying to say. You, it's, 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 it's isolated to that connection. That connection and what it's connecting to, but you don't transfer it from beam to beam because you'll never, you'll never uh, match these. It's it's a, it's a local force. Right, and I think that you no know, beam to girder connection is just where you chase that tube in the supporting girder. Is but then the you, you don't. You're looking at that particular connection for the beam to girder, and then for the girder, you're looking at whatever that girder tributary area is supporting. Yeah, so think, it has its own requirement. Yeah, I think what everyone has to realize is these requirements are not completely rational. Uh, <laughs> right. They, they were based. They were based, and Kurt did a lot of the work to figure out what level of forces might be appropriate. He actually did some calculations. They wouldn't bear up to check very well, but he did some calculations, uh, which is where the two thirds came from and the one third. This, this, this is base. Yeah, the cal the two third and one third is basically because you're looking at the nominal strength, and all you're looking at is the difference between LRFD and ASD. But so we just said that the horizontal force is going to equal the vertical reaction for ASD, which is two thirds of the f of the force for LRFD. So you're looking at the same nominal. But the force. intent the intent is to allow the structure if it gets distressed by the failure of something to develop catenaries. Uh, which is yeah. why, you know, the, with the composite slab present, the composite slabs yeah. do a lot, can hold up a lot of load yeah. in catenary. That, that's why we've got the 50% reduction if you have the two-way distribution through the slab and things are hanging up there. But I'm just confused. You said yielding was important, and now you said yielding is important. What do you mean? You said ignore tensile yielding. Well, you don't have, I don't think you have to check tensile, tensile yield. I'm talking about, I say I do a yield bottom analysis of my column web and ultimately no feedback is not the same factor. Yeah, you don't have to do that. Your, your yeah. bolts or your welds of your attachment to the column have to be able to develop the force. You don't, the you don't have to do a yield bottom on the column. You don't. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to do that. Okay, that's what I'm asking. Wednesday, you said that an in-flight connection welded to a support can take the actual load. Well, wait, wait a minute. No, no. Did we ever talk? No, that's 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 what what they were talking about the vertical in a, in an end plate for the vertical reaction. We're talking about axial load. No, no, that's that's not what Larry was well, saying. The first question was a T plate, a T connection. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's not what Larry, and then he said, no, that's, that's a different case that you're talking about because they were looking at the vertical reaction. They were thought you were talking about the vertical. A T with a plane's will to support cannot take an axial load. Kurt, I think there's a significant difference, though, in the question that you answered in that session and this question. Yeah. The question you answered, the, the deformation of the limit, if you're not having significant rotation, we're showing you catenary reaction. Yeah, maybe, maybe you and Kurt should talk about that <laughs> yeah. outside the room and let someone else have a chance. What are, I mean, there, these, uh, are these axial forces aren't put in a combination with the other? No. no, no, that was one of the provisions. It, this is only for that horizontal connection force. It's not combined with the vertical reaction or anything. This is a localized, it's an arbitrary force, and it really has no basis. <laughs> And remember, what we were trying to do, as I said earlier on, was develop something that wouldn't have much impact on the way people were doing design already. That, and we, that gets to the basics, Brian. It almost sounds like this was an apologetic presentation because you just said effectively that they were pushing on us to do something, so we did something. And when you look at Section 1600 and you see a provision there are two or three or four modifiers in the division, which to me is going to make life virtually impossible for these engineers to do. Um, you presented uh, details 
and said, there's more study needed on the detail. And then finally, I got to put all that, that reflection uh, together with the keynote of, uh, of uh, Wednesday, when uh, the code of standard practice is now allowing connection design to be changed or to be done by detailers and DEs, independent of the design structural engineer which in much parts of the country is the practice. I know it's not the practice out in California. And I'm looking at this, and I'm trying to understand how can a design engineer ever indicate what he expects the fabricator's detailer engineer to do? Uh, I think what you're going to find is going to happen is what happened in the UK. They largely ignore, and they basically say the connections work. In the end, that's what the UK has been doing for... Pardon? <laughs> I, I don't think it's as bad as that. Uh, I think what this will do is, it, is it's going to eliminate some types of connections and some type... The buildings that this applies to, you won't be doing seated connections. I don't think you're going to make them work. You're not going to be doing double angles or single angles that are welded to the column and supporting the beam because they're not going to work. Uh, as Kurt said, the single shear plate works pretty well. You may end up having to provide some extra edge distance uh, along the, the axis of the beam, but they work pretty well. But is this compatible with the utility and rotation? Absolutely. When you eliminate some of these details? Absolutely. So. Very simple question. If um, the beam entry in connection, if the connection is set high on the beam, like the upper half of the beam, we we are not addressing the position of the force on the beam. No, you're you're expecting that members mm -hmm. are going to twist, they're going to yeah. bend, they're going to yield. You just don't want them to pull apart. Was there any uh, the the what was the height limit based on height versus number of stories? The, the height the height is basically based on the IBC requirement for fire department access, which is basically no 75 control. feet above above the grade level where the fire truck can can fight, and that's that's what they define as a high rise building. Just tensile forces. Compression forces are basically, uh, you know, pressing against the column, pressing against the beam. Uh, what? And and that's the thing about this. We don't know what's causing this force. There's no basis for this force. A lot of it, you know, you think of fire. Well, in a fire, the problem is is not when the when the beam heats up and expands into the column. It's when the, when it cools down and pulls away from the column. You know, that's one thing they look at is, is fire. But this is not specific to a specific uh, event occurring that's causing this force. It's an arbitrary force. It's, it's basically, you're looking at a tensile tie force, like Ron said, can provide some catenary action, although I don't think you can ever develop the catenary action. You have to have too much deflection to get that. That's what we're testing now. AISC has started testing that. Because many of these infill beams are really light beams. Right. Right. And also I see... Uh, well, if they're, if they're light beams too, they're carrying very light load and your, and your axial force is at a nominal strength capacity. They've probably taken very little tensile force. What flood is very small rocks. Hmm? What flood is very small rocks. You just now said that you don't know what the same line is good for. So don't use it until it's tested and published. Well, that's what you're saying. That's what we're saying. That's exactly what we're saying. And also, I have a building a pretty tall and pretty thick power plant using the faculty that wants to well to the supporting land of the column. So that, that connection would not be accepted. That not probably is not going to work very well. Back? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the reason why this is difficult 
to understand is because the defendant in Kafka, without the low case definition, we structural engineer like to follow the low path. Uh, we like to have a low definition. For example, structural integrity for fire events, structural integrity for this, this, effect, structural integrity for an accident. This, this, this is a... This is a. Oh, are you done? <laughs> okay. This, 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 this is a uh, a minimum requirement. It's like saying I got to have two bolts in a connection or something. I mean, it's 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 not tied to a specific event occurring. It's not saying that you have to assess what happens in a fire or assess what happens in a blast. Is there any thought uh, that eventually is going to come? Just say use a minimum number of bolts, minimum Well, the, the problem, the problem, the problem with that is, is it, then it's not tied to a beam reaction, to a span, you know, to a span length or to a to a load on a beam. Well, here it is the load because you're basing it on the end shear reaction of the beam. Well, yeah, but but that's why we're basing it on an end shear reaction rather than saying, well, I've got to have uh, two bolts or something. We're saying, I got to have a force. I got to accommodate a force, which is going to be greater for a longer span beam than it is for a short span beam. I would like to respond to something that Erwin said before about and when the fabricator and the fabricator's engineer design the connection. How do you tell them what he designs for? Just as you do now, you'll have to put on the plans what the vertical reaction force is, and you'll know that he has to design for two thirds or one third of that. It's not a big thing, and you know, the light beams where you don't put the vertical reaction force, so you assume it's the force for that single shear connection in the, in the manual. Do the same thing you do now. It, it, that's not a problem. Uh, I thought that the uh, expression progressive collapse <coughs> be changed to disproportionate collapse. That's, <coughs> that's a, I mean, a common term. This is not really progressive collapse or disproportionate. That's, that's a term that yeah, progressive collapse is probably overused. I mean, people try to talk about more disproportionate collapse. Shankar has been pushing that for... Yeah, you know, that, that's really basic. You know, I'll go back a long, long time to when the ACI code was changed to open. And the word ultimate to the late person is a scary word. We have heard so much about progressive collapse. The public has been scared. We're not trying to stop them from necessarily from progressively collapsing. We're trying to stop them from disproportionately collapsing. So I think, I think right. this is this language is right. very important. Right. You won't actually find either of those terms in the, in the code. But, but, but the larger public community. You won't actually find either of those terms in the code. It talks about structural integrity. It doesn't, it doesn't talk about collapse at all. Peter is not in the code. The words that were up on the, on the screen are not in the uh, code. What, what Some you of the words were, was it the, the words that are in the code don't use the collapse word, either disproportionate or progressive. Oh, fine. Okay. Charlie. Kurt, um, I have the advantage of uh, not only having read your paper, but also knowing all the other work that you and Gay Hunter have done on this. And I want to ask you, uh, do you think you're being too modest in how you present this? Because seems like the work that you have done in comparing limit states for the vertical requirement and the horizontal requirement uh, show that double angles, single plates, uh, end plates, uh, I would think even single angles, uh, you can systematically show that for every horizontal limit state that you're going to check, there's one in the vertical that shows that this one will never control. Yeah, that, that, that works for the, for the single plate, the uh, double angle and the uh, end plate. But it, we don't know a lot about the performance of the single angle and, and whether you're going to get any additional uh, problem in, in, this, in the stretching of that single angle work versus uh, torsional lateral restraint of the top flange of the beam. Well, I, I, w I want to say I do think you're being too modest. Well, uh, I, I think that, that the work that you're doing there is going to be of help to the entire industry and the design oh. that you're going to show. I understand that research is coming, and it's great, but, but I think you're, you're into something there that, that people need to realize. You, you're going to be able to show that this has no impact, we, we, and they we, can say it's in there. We feel that when uh, 
when we get this resource. That folks, we're virtually going to be able to say that uh, all of the typical connections that you're designing, as long as you don't do anything stupid like put no edge distance on there, are, are going to meet the, the requirements without a problem. The ones that I mentioned you might have trouble with are, you know, the ones welded to the outstanding legs so, of you know, angle where you're putting the weld in torsion or something, or the seated connection. Uh, but that, again, basically, uh, whether you can reinforce it to take it <coughs> or not, something you really have to look at on that specific detail. Charlie, well, if that's the case, if, if you adhere to certain detail as just and stuff, wouldn't this be more restrictive? It just says if you follow the rules, you're going to really think that, that Kurt is doing this, dug into this better than Anywhere, but he spends so much time answering questions, then he goes home at night and he answers other questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I really think that uh, by the time Chris done with this, you're going to have a case where it's already it's already met the connections that we have in the manual. If you do something different, you can go through the same process. Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I think once you look at the paper, I mean, we've gone through these studies very thoroughly. The paper's 39 pages long, so it's not not simple to get through, but. It, it, it's fairly well, I think, uh, documented as to looking at all of the different limit states. And we're we're basically showing that virtually anything you're looking at is going to work. But if you pick the right connections, if you pick the right connections, yeah. But uh, <coughs> there are a couple of connections that may be a problem that we pointed out. And that was our intent, as I said at the beginning, to do something that would not change practice. Carol. Two questions. First one. And so, if the perimeter of the building. Again, you're still looking at just that connection, localized connection that it can connect to the girder. Don't look at punching. No, don't even look at punching. No. And then with the welded tees and the double angle, it's very similar connection where it's the outstanding legs that welded or the welded. Are you concerned because of the excess? In the, in the what? Welded to the outstanding leg? Right. Double angles welded. The, 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 pro the problem we're concerned about with that is, is the putting the torque on the weld. Because you're actually twisting the weld as the angles deform. Is that because of the excessive deformation? Or is that no, no, that's the, well, just the weld that's right near the, the vertical element, or the stem of the T, is going to get greatly overstressed right where the stem of the T comes in. It's just going to peel the weld off. There's no way to get the force distributed out to the outstanding leg. It's just going to overstress the weld right near where the, the vertical shear connector is. It will fail that and it will just progressively rip it off. Is the uh, interpretation of the high forces and required nominal strength, is that clear conformance with the language of the IBC or no, that's that's in the IBC because we talk about in there, like I showed, it's nominal. So we're just, we're just reiterating the language. Pardon? You're trying to reiterate that language. We're, we're, we're actually putting that, trying to put that in our specification. Well, that's my question. But it's, it is already, in, okay. that is already in the IBC. Okay, we're done. Thank you.